but basically it's bringing value to companies that you know, kind of have a disconnect between where they are today and where they want to go tomorrow. Welcome to Drop and Give Me 20, where you learn keys to entrepreneurial success as Lindsay Germono interviews business owners with military backgrounds on what works and what doesn't. Listen as they focus on the stories, both challenges and wins that military entrepreneurs have faced in growing their businesses. Welcome to another episode of Drop and Give Me 20. I am your host, Lindsay Germono, and I am joined today by Corey Chris. Good afternoon at this point, Corey. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you. And thank you. So for those that are listening, I have recorded 30, I guess, episodes of Drop and Give Me 20. And this was the first one that I went to sit down and record. We got through the whole discussion and it didn't record. So you are very patient and thank you for dealing with me being frazzled about that. No, no worries. It uh, gives us a chance to make it even better. Right, right. So Corey is an amazing leader. He has developed a company called Vethos. So Corey, tell us what Vethos is all about. Yeah, real quickly, Vitos, uh, I call it a human capital leadership firm and it's kind of a, a spin on, uh, I'm a big fan of the word leadership and not so much uh, management. That's just my personal take. But basically, it's bringing value to companies that you know kind of have a disconnect between where they are today and where they want to go tomorrow. So it's helping them well, with human resource strategy. It's helping them with sales and sales tactics and uh, strategic planning. But your background hasn't always been in this field. I was I was on your website and I was kind of poking around, so a little light light stalking. Um, <laughs> you are a retired special agent and criminal investigator, and you're a combat veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom. How did you go from that to an entrepreneur? Well, you know it's kind of funny the the the, the transition, but you know I was able to serve in an Air Force capacity and an investigative capacity for quite a while. And surprisingly, there's a lot of similarities and synergies between the investigative world and the entrepreneurial world. And so when I decided to retire, I've always had this entrepreneurial spirit. And I was able to take what I learned in the investigative world and the behavioral analysis world and apply it immediately to corporate world. So it became a, a pretty, you know, easy transition for me. Did you ever think, you know, when you were serving that you were going to one day open up your own company? Uh, you know, not not a chance. I, I really didn't think that, you know, when you're in the game and you're, you know, doing pretty significant things in the world and you kind of think you're going to do that until you decide you don't want to work anymore. I just came to the conclusion that you know, I, I had seen some things and been a part of some things that affected me, you know, mentally and emotionally. And I just wanted a, an opportunity to step away and focus on the entrepreneurial side of uh, my interest. And, you know, there's been no looking back. You know, I've worked with some, some just some awesome investigators, some of the best of the best. I love those guys. I love the organization. But I'm really, you know, happy in what I'm doing now. Do you apply anything that you learned along the way from your time in the service in the investigation background to Vethos? Yeah, absolutely. You know, our our business is all about people and and relating to people and, you know, you know, active listening and understanding some of the challenges that veteran companies and companies in general are experiencing. And after we've listened and understood, you know, hey, what's happening in these organizations? Then we can begin to collaborate with the owners and the leaders to build a strategy to take great companies to the next level or take companies that are desiring to be great and offering our input along the way. So I love that. And I even love that you've got that background of kind of investigative and really intricate thought processing and how you can apply that to businesses. We talked about this in my goof up. I should do like an outtake of that. And (laughs) one of the things that we started kicking around was this HR assessment. And something that you shared with me moments ago was this idea of, you know, analytics, behavioral analytics, and how you can use those into your HR practices. And I know as a military spouse owned company, I'm hiring and finding the right people and making sure that, you know, I'm getting the right people on board is 
you know, it's crucial, but I get stuck just like a lot of listeners, I'm sure on, you know, how do we make sure that we do that correctly? Yeah. And that's, I mean, it's always a gamble, right? Because unless you're getting a word of mouth referral, you're kind of wading out into the deep end in these interviews, you, you know, you're getting a, a resume, you might get a LinkedIn profile to, to check out. So it's really being able to take science and help companies, you know, they give their prospective candidate, you know, a five to 10 minute assessment. And before they take the assessment, we actually create a behavioral profile for a role. So let's say someone was hiring a, a marketing coordinator. Well, I would work with the CEO and, uh, or HR professional, and we would actually create a behavioral profile for that role that they're hiring for. And then when the person, the applicant or prospective candidate applies, they take an individual assessment to kind of see what their profile is. And then we match the two together. If they're close, you know, they're interviewed. If they're not, they're, they're kind of put aside for consideration or not. So basically, we're getting the behavioral fit to the table first. And then there's some consultation that goes along with taking the standard interview practices and kind of expanding upon those to ask more behavioral based questions as opposed to direct type questions. So So when we, you know, we were talking before, one of the other things that you mentioned was, you know, getting the right people to apply, like I mentioned before, but I didn't think about it this way either. So you're kind of removing the emotional part out of it. It sounds like, is that right? Right, right. Because once I create a behavioral views in that marketing coordinator example, I will actually, once I create the profile, I actually get language, right? I get a language that, you know, the HR person can use. And they take this language and they literally cut and paste it into their hiring announcement. And that specific language speaks to the profile of the person we're looking for. So even before the resume is, excuse me, even before the applicants are applying, science is working for you, right? You're going to get that person who connects with that language. And lo and behold, when they take their uh, behavioral assessment, they're going to be in line or close to being in line with what you're looking for. You, I think, save companies a lot of time and headache and probably a lot of money by doing that. Am I just I'm just assuming in the right path that, you know, to it costs a lot of money to onboard and hire and all that. So I love the fact that you provide that for, for companies. We talked a little bit about this before too, but I had asked you during that initial phase or period that, you know, you're hired the employee and there's like a 30 day, everything's brand new and shiny and everything's great. I also know that that's a really important time frame too, both from the employee as well as the employer. And so I'd love to ask you to share some tips on what a company can do during that time frame to make sure that that employee is going to stick and going to stay and also be happy. Sure. Yeah. Real quick, let me go back and give you a statistic that I think will resonate with your your listeners is that right now the national average is about 16% of the employee salary. Let's say you had a $50,000 employee. Every time that employee leaves your company as a result of turnover, it's costing you about eight grand for an executive employee, one to 1.5 times their annual salary uh, is what it's costing for turnover. So that should resonate with some of your listeners. But question you just asked, What's vitally important, sometimes when people are onboarded uh, into companies, they feel that the process, the human resource process is now complete, right? We've got, there was a vacancy, we've interviewed candidates, we think we've selected the best candidate, and now the person is ready to go. Well, this is where we tend to see missteps or mistakes being made. And what I mean by that is, Sometimes there's this tendency to go on to the next fire, right? Maybe there's another position we have to hire for. And now the person that has just been onboarded is kind of seated at their desk or their cubicle and they're kind of wondering, well, what do I do now? (laughs) So the tips are don't be afraid to connect that person with their immediate supervisor or their CEO if it's a smaller company. And the CEO needs to really outline on a person to person basis what are the expectations? You know, in the military, we call it an initial performance feedback. But really what that is, is it's not the nuts and bolts of the job. It's beginning to understand who the person is that you just hired and letting them see a little bit about you. It's being vulnerable. It's 
letting them know, hey, listen, we brought you here for a reason. We want you to be here, but at the same time, we care about you as a person. You know, what are your likes and dislikes? And, you know, beginning to foster that relationship for long-term growth. Awesome. I love that. And I think that from, if I had a manager, hiring manager that did that for me, it would make me feel even more valued as a new, I mean, I've started new positions for, and you just get thrown into this like training phase and you're not, you know, doing what you were hired to do and, you know, for a couple of weeks. And so I think that that's a really great conversation. And I appreciate you sharing that with us because even as a, a military owned company, my business is remote. I have employees that are remote. It is even more, and we don't sit in an office together. It's even more important to set that. So thank you for sharing that with us. I'm going to switch gears. You have a really interesting hobby also turning into another entrepreneurial avenue for you. Tell us about wine. You had me at wine. Um, Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I love wine too. Been making wine for about seven or eight years now in the past four to five years on a professional basis. I uh, grew up in the just outside of the Finger Lakes wine region in upstate New York. Uh, it's one of the oldest wine regions in our country, actually. Had the opportunity to work alongside some great winemakers who've taken me under their wing, kind of a grassroots effort to teach me the ins and outs. I did a graduate level program at Washington State University, kind of a hybrid program, both distance and on site kind of camps that I went to. But it's really been a hands-on working in the vineyards part-time, working in the production facility part-time, and learning it from the ground up. And we're launching our own veteran-centric label 2018. Oh, my goodness. That's awesome. Well, I can't wait for that to come out. And where can I sign up to pre-order my bottle? I love it. (laughs) Yeah, we're still working on the naming and websites, but... I got your name and number right now, so consider yourself uh, going to be getting one of the first ones off the production line. Yay! Oh my gosh, that makes me so happy. And I love love when I talk to entrepreneurs and they have a couple different entrepreneurial businesses or, you know, endeavors that they pursue. And someone had mentioned this to me that we are constantly, a a true entrepreneur is constantly looking and seeking and learning. And I I was, you know, wondering what your opinion on it is on that when I saw that you have two you know, very different lines of services that you, you know, are, are providing one in the leadership and consulting and coaching capability or capacity. And then now this one sounds a little more, you know, creative and fun, but I'm not discounting the amount of hard work that it, you know, you put into it. So what are your thoughts on, you know, entrepreneurs who have more than one kind of juggle more than one ball in the air, I should say? Well, those of us that do that, we have to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, we're, we're also the, the, the type of people that, you know, when the squirrel runs by, we tend to focus on, you know, that next shiny object, you know, like, <laughs> so we have to recognize that, that as much as it's a positive, it can be a weakness. And we have to surround ourselves with people who can kind of pick up the pieces from a detail part of each each position you know so i've got people in my inner circle who much more detail focused than i am now it sounds kind of funny from an investigator but i equate it to i can do detail oriented work in short bursts right that's why i wasn't very good in the cubicle cubicle farm of a, (laughs) a corporate world but my biggest piece of advice is you know once you understand who you you have in your inner circle you know you got to have folks who complement what you're doing, but at the same time that like doing detail work and that like, you know, delving into that repetitive type work that I know that I can't do. I'm the same as you. And so finding the people that can complement your not weak I don't like to use the word weaknesses, but the things that you're not so great at is key. You you know, you do a lot, you've done a lot for us and you know, I thank you for your service and everything that you're working towards now and getting people in, into the right companies and working with leaders, consulting with executives to make sure that, you know, they're aligned with success. But for those that are listening that are maybe in that space where they're in the military active duty, military spouse or even a veteran that you know, thinking about going out into entrepreneurship, what is the one piece of advice that you would give them? Well, you know, I, I've never been a rule follower, Lindsay, so I'm going to kind of give you two. So hopefully that that's okay. First and foremost, if you have that thought, right, if you're thinking about that thing at night before you go to bed and you feel motivated and you feel passionate about it, 
then it's time to do it, right? It's time to take that leap of faith. And I don't mean to do it blindly, but the part two of my kind of main point would be surround yourself with people who aren't necessarily going to tell you what you want to hear, aren't going to be the negative types of people who say, oh, well, you can't do that, or that's too hard, or that's too difficult. There's nothing easy about being an entrepreneur. I mean, there's nothing comfortable about being an entrepreneur. But the results that you can have by just taking that leap of faith and surrounding yourself with people who are going to lift you up, and, you know, they're, they're just unmatched. You know, take the leap. Jump. <laughs> Yeah, you got to start sometime. So start. Yeah. I love it. So I told you 20 minutes flies by, and especially when you're doing take two. <laughs> <laughs> but for those that are listening and, you know, they want to connect with you, let's share with them the different platforms that you're on so that they can follow along and connect and reach out to you. Yeah, yeah. So I'm on LinkedIn. Just hit me up at Corey Chrisman. Uh, you can't miss my big bald head on there. You know, send me a... Uh, Hit me up on my website at myvethos.com, M-Y-V-E-T-H-O-S.com. I'm on Twitter as well. I don't tweet as much as I probably should. But if you're interested in hiring veterans, if you're interested in growing your veteran population, if you have entrepreneurial questions, I'd be glad to help you. You know, I'm also on newly on Veterati as a mentor coach on Veterati. So check Veterati out. Great platform for veterans and military spouses and family members. So I'm eager to help. I do have stuff going on, but if you're passionate and you're looking for a little piece of advice, let's get together. Let's do it. Awesome. Well, you heard it from Corey. Reach out to Corey Christman on LinkedIn and it's C-O-R-E-Y Christman, C-H-R-I-S-T-M-A-N. And you can also find his website at my m y v t h o s v e t h o s dot com. And of course, you can always look up Veterati. I've heard a lot of great things about Veterati, so thank you for the work that you're doing there for us, Corey. I want to thank you for your understanding in my um, podcast uh, snafu, and you know, coming on the podcast, sharing all the great work that you do, and being a source of inspiration for us. And thank you also for your service in the military. Thank you very much, and it was a pleasure to speak with you, Lindsay. I'm thankful to uh, have been able to do so. Awesome. Well, you have a good afternoon. Yeah, you too. Thanks for listening to Drop and Give Me 20, brought to you by Dramono Advertising Company in Norfolk, Virginia. Please visit our podcast in iTunes, click on subscribe, and leave us a review. Your support goes a long way. When you subscribe and leave reviews, it helps the guests on our show as well. Jump in and let us know what you think. You can also follow all of our guests on the Drop and Give Me 20 Facebook page. We have Instagram and Twitter. Those handles are Give Me 20 Podcast. I'm your host, Lindsay Germono, and I appreciate you listening to the show.